1856, the United States of America. Slavery is still the driving force behind the southern state's cotton and agricultural industries. Some of these enslaved people chose to escape their plantations in the hope of gaining their freedom. That same year, one man named Joe Peterson would arrive in Salem, Ohio, one of many towns in the north that were sympathetic to runaway slaves and supported the abolitionist movement. Joe Peterson made it to Salem from Virginia through a system of safe houses and trustworthy people known as the Underground Railroad. Welcome back to another very special episode of Revamping History. I'm Roy, that's my brother Jesse, and we're currently standing in front of the John Street Senior House that's been recognized as one of the stations used on the Underground Railroad here in Salem, Ohio. Joe Peterson and others would have likely used a house like this during their escapes to freedom. But before we go any further, let's go back and see how all this got started. Slavery dates back to at least 3,500 BC in Mesopotamia. The first enslaved Africans were brought to North America around 1619. By the 1850s, there were millions of slaves that were being forced to live and work in the New World. Salem, Ohio was started by Zadok Street and John Strawn in 1806. Both of Salem's co-founders were avid Quakers with a strong belief that no man has the moral right to own another. Because of this, Salem, Ohio naturally became part of the Underground Railroad and an attractive hotspot to abolitionists. And the other thing we have to remember, Salem was a major abolitionist town. I mean, Ohio was as, as a state. When you get into Oberlin, Salem, Astabula, Youngstown, uh, these towns were, the abolitionists were very active. And then there's always those people who um, just pop up in history like, like Joe Peterson, that you're not looking for him. He's not relevant to history because his name isn't popular. He's not one who wrote a book about uh, his life as, as an uh, individual who traveled on the Underground Railroad. And to me, those are the kind of the common people that, need, that their stories need to be told because those are the people that the abolitionists were trying to help most. Since its founding, Salem has hosted many abolitionists, sympathetic Quakers, and other civil rights activists. In order for Joe Peterson and others to make it to freedom, they would depend on the help from these freedom fighters. There was a guy named George W. S. Lucas, and he was a conductor on the railroad and he traveled all over to take people up to towards Canada and Painesville. Um, he traveled all over. Marius Robinson, who was the editor of the Anti-Slavery Bugle, and he has a really interesting story because he was down in Cincinnati and he also worked on the philanthropist with um, James Burney. Marius is down there, they're needing, and this is early 1830s. There's a call that they need more teachers to, to teach free black children. And Emily Rakestraw from New Garden, which isn't too far away from Salem, she answers the call. She's a Quaker and she goes down to Cincinnati to teach free black children, which at the time is very dangerous. So Cincinnati, while it's full of abolitionists, it's also full of pro-slavery people. There was riots down there like 1829. There were some different riots going on. So definitely wasn't the safest career. In 1838, he was at a friend's house in Berlin, and they took Marius, and they severed his leg. They beat him, tarred and feathered him, and left him to die. But he didn't. He um, crawled back to like a house, and he was rejected at the first one, and the second one, they helped him. And um, he was like hurt for a while, but he, um, he didn't stop doing his work, because in 1851, he, um, published Sojourner Truth's Akron speech, her anti woman speech in Akron. Jacob Heaton, he actually owned the, a tavern that people would come and then they would sign in. So you had lots of people like Frederick Douglass, maybe um, William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips. Um, I don't, there, there's a whole list. 
and they would go and stay at his tavern, which is now the winery on Salem and State Street, Liebwein. Right, so Heather Smith was just talking about the Liebwein Winery's connection to Jacob Heaton and the Underground Railroad. So let's go inside and have a chat with the owners, Connie and Rich, and find out a little bit more about their building. So we bought two buildings in downtown Salem, um, 528 and 530. Um, the business downstairs, it was Sherwin-Williams, the paint store, and it goes into both buildings downstairs. So that's why we needed to purchase them both. Jacob Heaton was the original owner of this space. This was where his home was. Now next door to the left of us is where he had a dry goods store. Um, he was an abolitionist. Jacob Heaton is buried in town in Salem and uh, we did get to see his um, burial plot and stuff. Um, he's right in Hope Cemetery. He got known as this space being called the Quaker Tavern. And they would tell people that were traveling um, to stop in Salem and go to the Quaker Tavern. And Jacob Heaton would help them, would help them get dry goods and whatever they would need for their trip out west. We are open um, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Thursday we're open 5 to 10, Friday we're open um, 5 to 11, and Saturday is 3 to 11. It's been great, we've, you know, enjoyed it. We do lots of family functions here. We have um, Easter and different holidays and stuff with our family here, so the space is nice to share with, you know, our family and friends. We usually have live music every Friday or Saturday night. On Thursday, we um, have a Thursday, so we call it. And uh, if you come in, you can get a pitcher of sangria and a meat and cheese tray for $25. Going back to the Joe Peterson story, after spending several years in the Salem, Ohio area, Joe Peterson joined the Union Army during the American Civil War in 1864. He enlisted with Company C of the 4th United States Colored Volunteer Infantry. He ended up fighting in, in the Civil War for that one year, and then he ended up um, at the uh, sailor's uh, home in Sandusky, Ohio, before he came back to Salem. So basically, he, he was in the Civil War, then in the hospital, and then he came back to Salem to do work. All right, we're here at the Salem, Ohio Historical Society, where you can learn more about the Underground Railroad and the people who lived here. Let's go inside and find out more. Welcome to the Salem Historical Society. Our docents, our costumed guides, take you back to different periods in time. Today I'd like to take you back to 1850. Salem, Ohio was a hotbed of activity related to the Underground Railroad. Fueled in most part because the residents here were almost all Quakers. Quakers have some fundamental beliefs that led them to support abolition. They believe that all people are created equal and have rights. They believe in always telling the truth, that their outward lives should be a sign of their faith. At the museum, you're able to take a tour of different exhibits that relate to the Underground Railroad. You can also join guides like myself on the trolley and visit some of the sites that were prominent. Um, they were either homes of abolitionists, stations on the Underground Railroad, or um, places that played a role. Uh, we also point out some places that are no longer there. Things like our town hall, where Harriet Beecher Stowe, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin spoke, and she enlisted many people in our town to support the cause of abolition. 
The period where people were most strongly active in abolition was from the 1840s through the middle of the 1860s, near the close of the Civil War. And during that time frame, many people were assisted to escape to freedom through Salem. They used songs and stories to find direction, like to locate the North Star and walk or travel towards it. Now you may have heard at one point that slaves were free if they traveled to the North and that was enough. But after the passage of the Second Fugitive Slave Act in 1850, that was no longer enough. Coming to the North no longer ensured their safety. Slave catchers could come and repossess the property of the slave owners. And that meant that they actually had to leave the United States in order to be safe. Most of them traveled to Canada for several reasons. It was the close, closest neighbor, and since they were already traveling north, uh, if they continued just a little bit further, they would be there. The trip was arduous, uh, and it was dangerous for the local residents to assist them in their escape. Uh, a person who assisted a slave to escape could be fined, fined uh, 15 years salary at the time, $5,000. They could be imprisoned, their belongings could be seized. So it was very risky for people to help the slaves to escape. But many people did help them. And those people played different roles. There were people who provided funds and support for the cause. There were people who actually planned their routes. Um, they, there were people who assisted them and took them along the route. Those were conductors. There were station masters. Station masters are people who were in charge of a physical location, like a home, a building, perhaps a plot of land, a barn. Uh, and those were well-known locations to the abolitionists. They had to use code words and um, symbols Things like lanterns, a green lantern meant it was safe to proceed along the route. A red lantern meant it was not safe to hide until you got additional instructions. They used whistles and calls, coins. In Salem, they used pry bars, which were an aid to get people off of trains. When did people come? They came all year long. Now granted, in the spring, summer, and fall, the travel conditions were more conducive and it was also easier to hide because Ohio was heavily covered with foliage then. Lots of trees and forests in Ohio. Um, it's surprising for people today to think that in the 1800s, they said a squirrel could jump on a tree in Cincinnati and jump branch to branch and make it all the way to Cleveland and never touch the ground. So it was very easy to hide in the woods and the forest. Even places that are today cities and very well developed were mostly forests and farmers' fields. Um, we could use your help. Historians are always looking for correct information on our past. And there are reports, many reports. We have over 30 documented locations that were on the Underground Railroad in Salem. And by documented, I mean we've researched them. We have definitive proof that shows the people and or the activities that occurred there were related to the Underground Railroad. We have lots of reports of other locations. People say, oh, that house was on the Underground Railroad. Or we have a, a tunnel or a secret passage in our home. And we're happy to research that and to come and meet with you and, and look at those places and the information that you have to try to document them. We also have some information on um, black communities that were in the area. Uh, one of the 1830s documents talks about two black communities in Columbiana County. Now, um, the county lines have changed since that time. In the 1850s, they changed. And we've definitively located one of those communities to be Lexington, which is now in Stark County. But there's another community that was supposed to be located nearby of approximately 900 acres. And we've been unable to document exactly where that was and its role in the community at the time. So if you have any information on that community, 
other communities, people that you think may have been involved that we don't know about, or buildings and locations, please let us know. Our number is 330-337-8514, or you can email us uh, through the link on our webpage and help us out because we want to make this information more complete and available to a much broader audience. I'm sure there's many other questions that you might have about abolition and the Underground Railroad and the role that people in Salem played in that um, movement. And we would love to have you join us here at the Salem Historical Society to learn more about that. To understand more about the origins and the religious background of the Quaker belief system, we talked with the lead pastor of the First Friends Church in Salem, Ohio. The Quaker religion or maybe the Quaker theology or practice kind of all gets bundled together and there's a lot of differences in what may or may not be labeled Quaker or Friends. Um, and in two ways, like there's a, a big, big spectrum of what that word might mean today, depending on who you're talking to, what part of the country you're in. It's also true over time that what it meant to be a friend or a Quaker in 17th century England is a lot different than what it means in 21st century Northeast Ohio. For us today, as uh, part of Evangelical Friends Church, Salem First Friends Church, you know, really um, our our general theology is pretty similar to a lot of other um, Protestant evangelical type churches. It's where the, the difference comes in is what we call our distinctives, um, just different points of focus that are a little bit more um, uh, important or, or prevalent among us um, compared to other movements or denominations. Not that they don't have them, but they're sort of points of focus for us. And that would be things like um, simplicity, uh, something like integrity, a peace testimony, being uh, people of peace, um, being people who value equality um, really, really as an integral part of what it means to sort of act on the beliefs that we have as friends or as Quakers. The current um, Quaker community here at First Friends Church in Salem um, looks probably a lot different compared to maybe the historical one that would have existed uh, even a couple hundred years ago in the very same area. You know, uh, Quakers that long ago were more into uh, plain dress. Um, they were into speaking plainly to one another. Um, and as far as their worship is concerned, it was much more um, about silent worship, about waiting in a community of people for the Spirit to lead anyone to speak. There was no musical component to it. And so um, if you visited First Friends Church today, it's a lot different. We have music all the time. Um, we have preaching that happens by a particular person on a weekly basis. So um, some of those things are very, very different compared to what you would have had a couple hundred years ago. However, some of those distinctives are very much the same, at least we want them to be. Things like, uh, you know, integrity and inequality and things that we talked about. So, um, Quakerism got started with George Fox in England and his story is fascinating because um, his own personal experience was affected by what was happening in his world at the time. And he went through uh, huge times of just questioning and doubt and uncertainty and not feeling like there's a firm foundation for his life. Well, the same thing was happening in his world. Um, there, were, there was so much um, just craziness happening in the religious realm, in the political realm, in the social realm. Um, so as he was growing up in his formative years, he's seeing all of this uh, unbalance, this unsteadiness around him. Um, and this is happening, you know, there's a civil war in England that happens around the same time. There's the move from being uh, a Catholic nation to being an Anglican nation. And the fact that there are a ton of similarities there, but that it's the King of England who's sort of the head of the church. And once that started to happen, there are groups and pockets of people uh, and many contemporary with Quakers and friends that started to say, well, if we're willing to rewrite sort of the way institutional religion is done, then we want to change more than just one thing. We want to change this or these other things or throw the whole thing out and start from scratch. And I think that's where George Fox found himself. He was so disenfranchised with all of the 
institutions and the weight that they put on what it meant to be a Christian when in reality for him, he wanted to get back to away from institutionalism and saying, what does it mean to have a relationship personally with God and to do that within a community of people who are all genuinely, intentionally seeking to do the same thing. And that's really what, you know, uh, Quakerism and, and the movement of Friends, it was, it was born out of that. If somebody wanted to worship with us here at First Friends, we are here every Sunday. 10.30 in the morning is sort of our big celebration service in our sanctuary. We also have a time that's a little more simpler, which is called our simplicity service, that's at 8 a.m. and smaller in our chapel area. And so it's kind of, it, that's available for people who don't like big crowds, who don't like um, a lot of extra stuff. It's shorter, it's more compact, but yeah, every single Sunday, 8 o'clock, 10.30, we are here and we are always uh, opening our doors and wel welcoming in people who want to visit and worship with us. A major contributing factor for the continuing need of the Underground Railroad was a series of pro-slavery laws put into effect referred to as the Black Laws. To better understand the Black Laws, we spoke with the author of The Black Laws, Race and the Legal Process in Early Ohio. What got me into taking a look at Ohio is that um, while working on my doctorate at Miami University, I was looking around for a dissertation topic. And I, I chose Salman P. Chase, uh, former governor of Ohio, uh, having had an interest in the presidency, never got there, and chief justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. And one of the things Salman Chase did in his law practice was represent uh, black Americans who were, had escaped from slavery, made it to Ohio, were recaptured, and Chase then became the lawyer who tried to get them off because of Ohio's legacy as a, as a free state. So that Chase, looking at Chase, that took me to the black laws. That there was no federal law creating slavery. And if you think about the Constitution and think about the legislation of Congress, they gave slaveholders the right to recapture, but to recapture a certain category of individuals. And that category included individuals who ran away from slavery and ended up in a free jurisdiction. So Chase said then that if a slaveholder touched Ohio soil, voluntarily or gave permission to an enslaved person who touched the higher soil, then the slaveholder then lost the ability to control that person as a slave in this free jurisdiction. So this is a new idea. And the lawyer you went in the courts, the more difficult, a justice of the peace, for example, had accepting it. But as this idea went higher, some judges began to look more seriously at it. So that was his difficulty advancing this new way of looking at the law with respect to enslaved blacks. Uh, at, a, at, a given, at any given time, uh, people just can't see what they cannot see. But then some people are going to get a spark of insight where their consciousness expands and they see a whole new world. James Burney, Salman Chase were two of those individuals and there were many more. So in the case of James Burney, then, he was in the South. He was in, I think it was in Alabama, one of the Southern states. A uh, Burney is looking at these people being enslaved and he's having a conflict of conscience. You know, he's seeing people forcing, coercing by violence to make these individuals work. And he said, wait, wait a minute, something is wrong with that. His consciousness was expanding. So what he did then, he made this deliberate decision that he would transport the people under his power into a free jurisdiction, a jurisdiction where the law said that they could not be held in bondage, and he would voluntarily, because of his consciousness, the evolution of it, free them in that state. But I, I would argue, though, that there was a cooperative movement between Black Americans and white Americans to alleviate the sufferings connected with slavery. Uh, the Underground Railroad would not have worked, could not have worked if either of those elements in their active participation was missing. 
All right, so now we're gonna show a few items from our personal collection that have to do with this subject matter. This first one here is a newspaper. It's a newspaper from 1798. It's the Baltimore Gazette. And it contains you know, a couple of articles about giving rewards for catching runaway slaves. So it showed at that time, this is really common stuff. The second one here is from 1806. This was the, basically it's a United States Gazette for the country. This one also contains little ads about slaves. I think this one contains a couple about slave auctions, about how to buy them. So this was really mainstream at the time. It was accepted. Even the people who were against it, this probably horrified them seeing this type of stuff. And this third newspaper here is a New York Tribune. This one is from 1859. It contains an article. It talks a little bit about John Brown and what they were gonna do with him. So these three newspapers, they all have to do with the slaves or John Brown situation. <clears throat> all right, the next piece we have here, this is a commemorative plate that we actually picked up at the Salem Historical Society. And it has some of the names of some of the more important abolitionists and people that came through Salem. Yeah, we got Howell Highs, Frederick Douglass, Edwin Coppock, William Lloyd Garrison, and Marius Robinson, as well as it shows a little bit of the Freedom Hall. So you can still get these at the Salem Historical Society, so if you ever get a chance to go in there, they're real affordable, and it's a good little piece of memory here of history. All right, and we also have a good collection of these CDV photos. So we pulled a couple of them out. Um, first one here is a woman from Salem. Not sure exactly if she was a Quaker, kind of looks like one a little bit, but this is old. And just this one's unidentified like most of our photos and don't exactly know what year this was printed. Second one is a, another lady that had her picture taken in Salem. Like we know it's from Salem because on the back, it says the company that took the photo. And there's a gentleman here who also got his picture taken in Salem. So, so these last three pictures were maybe Salem residents, maybe they were from out in the countryside and they came into the town to get their photos taken. But we're lucky to have a few of these. And this last photo is of um, General Grant, who later went on to become president. He's from Ohio, a lot of Ohio ties. And this is one of our favorite photos that we have in our collection. So that's just some of our pieces that we have out of our collection. Another notable abolitionist from Columbiana County, Ohio, is Edwin Coppock. Edwin Coppock was born outside of Winona, Ohio, just a few minutes from Salem. Edwin and his brother Barkley joined up with John Brown's crusade to end slavery. The Coppocks were with John Brown in Harper's Ferry, Virginia. After the failed attempt to take over the armory and arm local slaves, Edwin Coppock was hanged alongside John Brown and the other captured members of Brown's party. The younger brother Barkley was stationed just outside of Harper's Ferry and was able to escape with a few others. Edwin Coppock was eventually buried in Hope Cemetery in Salem. So that was our story on the Underground Railroad in Salem, Ohio. And remember, nobody alive today was responsible for anything that happened during the slavery era in the United States. What we are responsible for is how we act today, and if we're lucky enough to see it, how we act tomorrow. We want to thank all of our guests for being on our program, and most importantly, thank you for watching. See you next time. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see twas grace that taught my